Well, thanks everybody. And today we're gonna talk about children, the church and the body of Christ. And I'm gonna encourage you to just ask me questions or if you have a thought or questions as we go, please just raise your hand. We'll have it as a discussion. So I'll be discussing children in childhood. And of course, we've all been children. But in our childhoods, we may have had wonderful experiences, but we may have also had difficult, traumatic, and or complex experiences. And I'll be touching on the topics of adverse childhood experiences and the clerical sexual abuse of children in the church. And if any of these topics are uncomfortable or triggering for you at any point, please feel free to step out of this talk. So Carl Rahner would say about children, scripture doesn't give us a definition of a child. It presupposes that we already know what a child is. So how do we know what a child is? And Rahner would say we should uh, rely on the complex experiences of our own lives and our contacts with children, and it is complex, and, and our own experience of our own childhood. So in, in honor of that, I'm inviting you now just to remember something about your childhood so we can kind of get into that frame. And if you would like to just take a moment in your own mind to remember something, a favorite toy, a special place, a particular event, and indulge me um, as you bring back that childhood memory, um, turn to the person next to you and just share this brief moment in your childhood. Now, you're not a, uh, I, I assume that, you know, many of us as we go on our trajectories put our childhoods far behind us, but Rahner would say, no, our childhoods are really with us throughout our entire life. And those childhood memories, as you'll see in this talk, uh, influences along the whole life trajectory. So for a minute now, just turn to somebody and just have a memory of childhood for a minute, if you can. Or make a threesome up if you want to have, need to. So I'll invite you to share with the class any words that came to mind as you remember that experience. Just popcorn out a word or two to help us. What was the sense of that? I thought about pets. Pets. Yeah. Happy, yeah, sad, very happy. Happy, very happy. Happy memory about yeah. pets. Okay. I thought about getting a pair of really bright new shoes, and uh, they were all colors of the rainbow, and, and just spinning in the grass wearing my new shoes that were a gift from my godmother when I was about five. And that was joy for me. Anybody else have a word that comes from your childhood? Now, why would this be important for us to reconnect? Because how children and childhood are seen are shaped by our individual experiences. But those experiences are embedded in our cultural, institutional, and religious paradigms. And how children are seen and understood shapes our behavior toward them. So it is actually important to think, what is our view of children as individuals, as family members, as members of our institutions, as members of the church? And in Western history, there have been these mythological images of childhood. So the Dionysian child. This was a child that was thought, children were thought to possess intrinsic evil or corruption that would seek an outlet in their behavior. They were, they were acting out that evil. They mu this must be rooted out by moral training. And the orig this originated with the concept of original sin. And that is not, you know, this child was not a very happy child to think about. Um, it made the adults, uh, it, it tasked the adults with rooting out this, this intrinsic evil by training. But in, there was also the Apollonian child, the uh, Rousseauian child that was thought to be innocent and angelic, untainted, free fall. And they offered their parents a source of existential meaning. And uh, the child's future justified the parents' present toil and suffering because the, they wanted to preserve this innocent, angelic child and get them a better future. Now, the, they're called mythological because these are, of course, not real images of real children, but they were societal images of children that influenced a lot of behavior. So if you were thinking about the child as the Dionysian child, then corporal punishment might be 
something you would accept and think, yes, of course, well, that's what we do. If you were thinking of the Apollonian child, you would think, well, we have to protect that child from all the reality of the world, and maybe we'll just bubble wrap that child. And of course, these are cultural tropes that get in the culture and influence the way children are thought about and treated. Now, children in the West, and we're just touching on the West today, in the late 19th and earliest, early 20th century, the children were in part of the workforce. There were many children in poverty. There was a lot of ill health. But that concern about those children was evolving to a, a child needing to be protected from the adult world and hardship. So we were taking the child worker. There was a lot of social action about getting children out of the workforce, protecting the children. Um, uh, you're familiar with the SPCA, Protection of Animals. The original founding of the SPCA was really the Society for Protection of Children and Animals. They dropped the children, but that's where that all started in this early 20th century. Um, mid 20th century, children were thought, well, they're on an incremental pathway to adulthood. They have each stage of growth. They learn more. They do more. They're not yet adults. But um, so they're not agents in their own right, but they're on their way. And then the 21st century, as we've thought more about children's rights and agency, um, we've tried to understand childhood as a distinct time with its own meaning, not just a time of a becoming of adults. So children could be seen as both beings in their own right and becomings. And if you spend a minute to think about the, all these thoughts about what children are and who they are do influence how we treat children and what provisions we make for them. But we can't discount what the actual experience of children are. Now, I hope that in your shared memories, you were able to think of and share good memories. Um, maybe you shared some complex memories, or maybe even memories that weren't so good. But children, in reality, are relatively powerless. They're most affected by climate change, much more so than adults. They're most likely to be living in poverty. Half the children under six in the United States live in 200% uh, of the poverty level or below. Um, they suffer disproportionately, as I said, from poverty, hunger, abuse, and conflict. And they bear the lifelong physical, mental, and emotional impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences. And we'll talk about that in a minute. These early life experiences, both good and bad, they are biologically embedded. And they influence your later health, your educational attainment, economic stability across the lifespan. So what happens to a child isn't trivial. It's actually very important, because what happens in childhood can set in motion a trajectory of events that carries through for their whole life. One of the things that helps children, even in dire circumstances, is to have a safe, stable, nurturing relationship. So years ago in Hawaii, there was a study of poor children that, that were in poverty. And the question was, you know, some of these children turned out to have successful educational careers. They did well. They had families. Some did not, uh, were not as successful. They suffered. What was the difference? And the difference was one caring adult. So one caring adult that cared about that child, that paid attention to that child, that interacted with that child was the difference because that one caring adult was a stable, nurturing relationship that was able to buffer some of the chronic stress and, and um, turn that acute stress, help it from becoming chronic, lifelong stress. So the difference was one adult, one adult. So how many of you he have heard of adverse childhood experiences before? Anybody? OK. So this is a concept that maybe 20 years ago, a doctor named Vincent Folletti in California interviewed a bunch of adults. And the adults actually had obesity and a lot of chronic health problems. And he asked them one question. He said, what happened to you as children? And he was astounded to find out that these adults had a large number of these events in childhood that were adverse more so than healthy adults. So adverse childhood experiences could be child abuse or neglect, could be being exposed to domestic violence or being members of a gang or being a victim of a crime. It could be an, a, a child who had to immigrate or migrate 
um, ending powerful relationships, moving to a new scenario. It could be children that had experienced racism, uh, sexism, weight bias, uh, prejudice against LBG, uh, LGBTQ. It could be a child that grew up with a mother or father who had substance abuse or intergenerational trauma. It could be uh, children who had adult responsibilities too soon. They had to be a, a caretaker of another family member. And about you know, over a million children in this country have to take care of sick family members. And it could be a traumatic death in the family. So these adults reported a high number of these adverse events. And what happened was that there was a direct correlation between how much adversity they had as children and what their health was. And you can look at that list and see tobacco and alcohol, substance abuse, risky sexual behaviors, obesity, cardiovascular disease, lung and liver disease, mental illness, and cancer. And this has been reproduced over and over again. So these traumatic experiences in childhood literally get embedded in our biology. They turn on stress responses. They alter our blood pressure. They alter our hormones. They alter our epigenetics. And if not turned off, result in this chronic disease. So what can help a child? Safe, stable, nurturing relationships, one caring adult. What can guarantee that a child's not going to emerge from this is to have none, no nurturing care to help them buffer what's happening and to be living in poverty and to be living in adversity. So how does the Catholic Church view children? Well, you know, when you look at how the Catholic Church's output of social teaching, um, you find that they're really adopting cultural norms. They're adopting, they're sort of taking from society what society thinks children are and reacting to that. And you can, and um, this question is really thrown into relief and was thrown into relief uh, for me uh, by the clerical sexual abuse of children in the church. So what a, a telling uh, sort of thing that tells you how the church really views children. So when, I, when you look at Catholic social teaching, you see that children remain marginalized in theological thinking. They're, they're on, off to the periphery. They're seen as incomplete adults whose value is in their potential to be formed. Um, discussion of children when you see it is largely about pedagogy and catechesis. Instructions to parents have been kind of top down, not really getting input from where the parents are. Um, childhood and culture and the church is most, of, is most often viewed from the perspective of adults. So you might have found when you're trying to retrieve a childhood memory that you've, you've already adopted an adult perspective of children. It's hard sometimes to get back into what it was like to be a child. Many of us, you know, it's hard to remember that because it's sort of society just pulls you forward out of that. Um, the church has really not sufficiently addressed systemic factors in society that result to harm for children, poverty, racism, um, bias, and stigma. Um, and the obligation of the church, of course, to care for and protect the children inside and outside the church has not been fulfilled. And so I think it's fair we could say the church, although scripturally grounded in Jesus' compassionate regard for children, has social policy concerning children that is influenced more by current culture than by a grounded and responsive theological approach to children. And, of, and here we have the, the, the kind of the sentinel event that really signals uh, how far away from caring about children we really are. So uh, many of you might be uh, aware, maybe unaware, that there are sequelae of, the, of abuse to children. Now you've seen the adverse experiences, and so sur uh, survivors of the abuse have physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual consequences. They can become desensitized, oblivious to others and signs of distress. They suffer humiliation and guilt and negation of self and feel abandoned by God. And many of them report the loss of their childhood. When that abuse happens, their childhood is gone. Um, they feel wounded by the betrayal of trust enacted by the priest abuser because the priest represents the church and God. So this is a spiritual wound as well. And there are a lot, all, all those long-term consequences you see there, depression, self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide, alcohol, drug dependency, chronic disease, eating disorders, anxiety, issues with school performance are all long-term sequelae of abuse, that trauma in childhood. And survivors of childhood sexual abuse by priests have a name for what has happened to them, and they call it soul murder. And this is the loss of selfhood and core, 
selfhood and core relationships. So um, it's kind of astounding to think that this has happened in the church. Now, the church has tried to respond, and uh, there's a pontifical commission for the protection of minors, and it's, been, it's about 10 years old. And in 2022, Pope Francis asked them to write a report to, to try to get some more transparency and accountability into what is actually happening, who's doing what, is it still going on, what has happened. And you, you can see there um, in a, a, a pay, uh, participants in a focus group, participants who've been abused, as late as 2024 said, we are very specific when we show our wounds, but the church response is not concrete. It is cold, vague, or none at all. So as, as late as this year, uh, victims have felt the church has not responded. The commission wanted to focus on safety, policies, procedures, and mechanisms, care owed to those impacted by abuse. They can't yet audit how many kids have been, uh, victims have been abused. They don't have the capacity to do that. And uh, they hope that in the future they will. Um, they want the victims to have access to the truth, the right of individuals to have information that's held about them by the church. They want to uniformly def define vulnerability to pr promote global coherent judicial outcomes. They want to end the, the delays that the church has uh, ha enacted to respond to these claims. And um, still they're working on disciplinary administrative proceedings um, for the resignation or removal from office. Um, and this becomes important when we'll talk a little bit about what what kind, what, where this response is coming from. But the commission said in this latest report of October 24th, in its 10 years of service, the commission has seen church leaders who have been the source of additional harm to victims, to survivors of sexual abuse, still, still active. Um, they would like to provoke, promote a conversation, conversion within the church. That's good. An encyclical maybe about protection. They want to compensate the victims economically, acknowledging mistakes, public apologies, um, and professional training to safeguard the children. Many victims feel that hasn't been enough, and many theologians feel that hasn't been enough. So you'll, uh, uh, Reverend Orobater uh, from the African Church said rec he, in his own work on AIDS, said he, he, we need to recognize that the body of Christ is not just an adult body. And he indicts himself as in his work on AIDS as just thinking of the body of Christ as an adult body. Hans Ulner, who for many years chaired the commission on uh, Pontifical Commission on Abuse, just resigned last year, said uh, Christianity instrumentalizes childhood and devalues it. We need to focus on a Christian theology of the child. And James McAvoy would say we need to include children in how we think about theological anthropology. So that brings us to how could we do that? How would we think about how to help children, how to understand children, how to incorporate children uh, into the, the church in a way that, that is befitting them? So the body of Christ is a part of the way the church understands itself. And how the church sees itself is connected to the how the church sees children. And many of you might know the story of Paul. Uh, after two millennia, scholars are still discussing what Paul meant by referring to the body of Christ. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. This has been up for discussion since Paul said it. Many um, theologians look back to Paul on the road to Damascus when um, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting as Saul was going in to persecute the community. So many people have thought about the body of Christ. What does it mean? And so the simple answer is, it's just a metaphor. It's just, we said the church, is, uh, we're, the community is like the body of Christ because we're referring to its ethical norms, its, its political uh, structure for theological purposes. We're promoting unity um, to encourage ethical behavior, um, to, uh, to uh, forge connections in the community. Uh, the liberation theologist said that it's a protest against dominant systems. Um, it may be political language, people have said, with an anti-imperial gospel, Jesus as opposed to the emperor. So many people have said it's just a metaphor. It's just the body of Christ. It's like the body. It's a, it's a social organization. 
the Catholic Church has really, in, in trying to say, well, it's more than that, really. Really, it's more than just a metaphor. It's a relationship between Christ, each individual, and the community. It's a mystical body. It's a spiritual relationship. That makes it harder to define. It's a spiritual organism, mystically identified with the body of Christ, a collection of people forming the church. That sounds vague. It is hard to define. Christ's people bound to him and each other by God's spirit. Um, one living reality in union with Christ as the head through the Holy Spirit. So people have thought, well, it's really more than just a corporate entity. It's a mystical body. And then some theologians have said, no, no, no. Paul really meant it's a physical body. It's an organism. The community is a, is a body, like an organism. It's a single physical entity where disunion is dismemberment. Bodies, as, as soma in the Greek, are not merely spirits, uh, but this is an unexplainable connection. It's a bodily connection between us. It's a literal corporal relationship. Um, some theologians have said modern man doesn't possess the philosophical assumptions to get this kind of idea. We can't get it, we just don't have it. We have divide the mind and the body, the mind, body, and spirit, and we just can't conceive of it. Um, but they, they're, they're a core of theologians that say, but we have to take the physical body seriously. And Dale Martin would say, contemporary scholars would do better to try to imagine how ancient Greeks and Romans could see as natural what seems to us bizarre. The non-existence of the individual, the fluidity of the elements that make up the self, and the essential continuity of the human body with its surroundings. So this is a, actually a radical concept to modern people. How can this be possible? Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but when you realize that identity impacts behavior and relationships, if you think, oh, the body of Christ is just a metaphor, and the church is a corporate identity, then you're going to focus on what? Structure, procedures, dogma, and unity. One might say in, in looking at the commission's response that the church is thinking of the body of Christ in this kind of metaphorical way. If you think of the body as mystical, it becomes more transcendent, and it becomes our relationship with Christ as spirit. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, we can think about that. It, it has a reality, but it's a spiritual reality. What if the body really means more than that? What if it's corpor corporal and not corporate? What if it really is alluding to a community as a single physical entity with integrated embodied relationships with each other in Christ? What if that's what Paul meant? What if we thought about the body of Christ as a physical body? Does that help us with an approach to children? So we could think the physical body is a complete body incomplete without full inclusion of children. The body, our bodies, are completely connected. So you have pain in one part of your body, it affects your entire body. So why isn't the pain of the children affecting the entire body? The body has a built-in capacity and need for relationship. We are built to relate to each other. Our minds are both embodied and relational. They're not divorced from our bodies, they are our bodies. And the body's health and well-being is predicated on our network of social supports. So what does it mean when we think about the physicality of what that body of Christ might bring to our thinking about how we care for each other and how we care for children? Have any of you ever studied or heard about brain synchrony? Well, in truth, we all have our neural activity in our brain, and when we're individually kind of sitting here in class maybe, meditating on something, using your phone, your neurons are firing in a certain pattern. But if you turn and start to talk to somebody for more than a minute and start to interact with that person and have a conversation, you, slow, you see that when, they, when measured brain activity, EEGs, you start to synchronize neural activity. And brain activity synchronizes in, inter in interactions with each other. And the longer and stronger the, the relationship is, the more synchrony, so close friends. When you're with a close friend, you're not, you know, that closeness is more than just emotional closeness. That closeness is your brain start synchronizing their neural activity together. Teachers, very effective teachers and students who are in a classroom who are relating to each other, setting, you, you sort of get on the same wavelength, you're literally getting on the same wavelength. Your brains are literally synchronizing. So we are built physiologically to interact with each other. 
we are all we are all built in other ways for relationships. So human attachment is really neurobiological. So at the at the very foundation of it, there's behavioral synchrony. You're with a group of friends. Somebody starts fiddling with their hair. The next person fiddles with their hair. Somebody starts swaying. The next person starts swaying. You're in behavioral synchrony. It's just automatic. You're not even thinking about it. Heart rates start to couple, especially, and you can see that hierarchy of relationships, a very intense uh, parent-infant relationship or romantic partner relationship, friends and strangers is uh, more synchrony the closer you get. So heart rates start to synchronize. Hormonal responses. You start to secrete hormones when you're with people. And hormones start to synchronize and brains start to synchronize. So if that's what the body is, and that's what the physical body could do, you know, what might it mean to think of the, the body of Christ as a physical body? Because the body is the means through which we experience existence. Our relational and physical environments clearly impact our bodies. You heard about adverse childhood experiences. You heard about this relational synchrony that we get in. We suffer when our body is threatened. And when we're sick or we're hurt, we start to ask questions. Why did this happen? What's going on? We then get tran these transcendental existential questions going on. When, what we experience in our minds is highly influenced by our relationship and shared connection with others. We think we're operating independently. But next time you're in a group or with a close friend or with a romantic partner, you know, there is actual synchrony going on. And if you've ever been with a really close friend and you start to finish each other's sentences, that's not accidental. You're actually thinking in synchrony. Um, not acknowledging the child as a full member of the body of Christ in this kind of paradigm really forecloses our future as a planet, society, and church. We're not including... The, the most important people that are, are going to be our future in our bodies. So what if the church thought of itself as an embodied body of Christ? What might happen? Well, the suffering of children would be real suffering. They would suffer and we would suffer with them and would be felt like we feel an ache in our our toe or, you know, an earache. We, we would feel that part of the body suffering and act on it. Children would be recognized as an important part of the church, not just an appendage or a becoming. They'd be valued for being who they are, not as a means for an evangelical, educational, or personal end. And we might be able to incorporate Jesus' approach to children, his compassionate approach to children, and take into account Jesus' incarnation as a child. Um, the church would ground its understanding of children in what we know now about child development and the church might have an understanding and respect for childhood. So I just offer you some thoughts about what it means to be a child, what it might mean to be a body, what it might mean to be in the church, and what might the church be able to do if it took itself seriously as the body of Christ. So thank you, and you know, if anybody has any thoughts or questions, I'd love to hear it. And I mean I'd love to hear it. This is a word, this is just, you know, thinking together about this. Sandy, may I ask a clarification yeah. question? So, so this, this physical synchronicity yeah. is yeah. fascinating yeah. stuff, right? Um, are there any studies that measure whether there's any kind of physical synchronicity when you're online with somebody, like Zooming? Not yet, but the, the com I will tell you, people doing research in, like, um, gaming, Mm -hmm. are incredibly interested in this. Mm -hmm. the, the people doing most research in what it means to sort of be emotionally tied, not only to each other, but to a virtual other. Right. You know, like, are we going to get, like, can you get in sync with an AI? Like, do your, do your oxytocin levels go up with an AI like they do with a person? Right. And there's some early indications that some of that is happening. But the, they're the people that are most interested in this clearly because of the gaming. So, so you know what, I, I would buy into what you're saying about gaming. I've never seen my son so emotionally active as when he was gaming with his buddies. Yeah. Right? Not yeah. always good emotions, yeah. right? Sometimes yeah. yelling and screaming yeah. and insulting other mothers, yeah. mothers right? Yeah. Um, but he was certainly very emotionally involved. In well, you know, we have capacity. We're built for relationship, right? It's our job to, like, manage relationship with who, mm -hmm. whom. Right? So we're relationship with each other, with our friends, 
with our virtual counterparts, you know, we're built for it, we'll react. Yeah. Any thoughts about children and the church? I, I have a question. Yeah. So, so when I think about it, so I was born and raised in a very different context. Yeah. I was born in a small farm town. Yeah. And basically, I had a job. My parents didn't have any job, right? Their job was just to work and put food on the table, right? My job was to get out of the house as much yeah. as possible, right? Always check in around dinner time. Always make sure I'm back before dark, right? So when I think about my childhood, I think about a lot of freedom, right? Once you get a bike, you explore your whole environment. You can pack up with kids and go down to the creek, pond, stuff like that. So it's kind of like a very dream and idyllic childhood in the yeah. sense of having a lot of freedom, not having a lot of concerns. And this was in the day before... People thought there were, you know, child molesters lurking yeah. around every corner, right? So my parents didn't even worry about yeah. that stuff, right? Just get out of the house, right? Um, when I think about kids today, right? Number one, their lives are highly regimented and planned by their parents, right? Yeah. Number two, they've always got some kind of parental supervision. Number three, they've always got some kind of you know, really cultural or sports or, or, or music activity on the horizon. And so there, there's a marked difference in the kind of lives that kids lead today. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about... So it, I think it would be much easier to have an effect on kids in my early context because kids were so accessible, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to get access to kids these days because they're always doing something. There's, there's very little unstructured time yeah. where you can actually get kids to work with them, do things with them. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, again, you know, what we said early on, culture, we, I, we define childhood, but the culture really defines childhood. You know, and so childhood looks very different now than it did. And what we don't know is what the outcome of that difference is going to be. You know, um, are we, the job of parents in essence is to equip the children to function in the world. So the parent is sort of the gatekeeper. Right. right. And you see parents, you know, letting you run around in the woods and now parents who sense maybe a, a scary world are now equipping children with that sort of safety knowledge in their head at all times. You've got to be careful what you do and what you say. So, you know, it's hard to knock parents because parents are desperately, I think, trying to figure out how to prepare the kids the best way to function in the world that they, they see. Mm -hmm. You know, and the worlds are very different depending on what economic strata you're from, mm -hmm. what maybe ethnic group you're from? Are you a, a population that, that is you know, marginalized? Uh, the preparation at, for children in each of those groups is very, very different. And I'm not sure we understand. You know, it's hard because people don't tend, they, they don't talk about their childhoods in that way that I'm not sure we understand completely how different it is to be, I'm looking at, you know, to be growing up in poverty and, and maybe, say, African-American and what you have to watch out for versus growing up in the suburbs as a white suburban child. Yeah. yeah. Um, at the risk of being a little political, um, given the new president-elect, I just want to know your, your thoughts or opinions on uh, the threat to our you know, Department of Education and how that would affect the future of children yeah. in America, and also with the... Yeah, I just will take one step back I, and, and then I'll answer your question. Being a child advocate, even at the best of times, is hard because children, everybody goes, I love children. Of course I love children. And I've been across from senators who say, well, you know, I say, well, you know, if you don't fund Medicaid, children are going to get sick. Oh, what do you say? And, he, and, you know, he literally slammed his hand down on the table and said, I'm a good father. And that's, that's kind of where we're at. Like, people say their definition of caring about children is I care about my children, <clears throat> right? And so advocacy becomes very difficult because they're, they're, not, they, they, they're not able, maybe, or willing to look out. So that's when you get into predicaments about making judgments across a whole population Knowing maybe that would, not even asking yourself the question, would you let your child be subject to that? Because you're going to protect your child. 
it's, it's using childhood as a tool, right, to gain some end. And so I think advocacy, I've told my child advocate friends, it's more important now than ever to advocate because we're in a circumstance where we're not sure what's gonna happen and it's hard enough for children. And we know COVID, we know one thing, COVID destroyed maybe three years of education for most people. And I know you guys went through it, I did not, but the, the losses that we had are, are profound. You know, unless you were in a privileged situation where, you know, somebody was able to teach you and you were able to keep up your social contacts, contacts we've lost, you know, people have lost milestones and development that they're not gonna get back. So if any time education is jeopardized, to your point, that's what happens. You know, start monkeying with the educational system, then children lose. And the sad part about that trajectory is hard once you're off the trajectory for any reason to get back on it and, and succeed. So I think that we're, we all have to be aware and asking ourselves, you know, what's gonna happen and how do we advocate for keeping children uh, on that developmental trajectory that they need to have. And you know this, even in, as college students, everything builds on everything else, all right? So we know from early education that children in poverty, and especially children who have parents who have uh, lower educational status, hear less words as children. So they hear less words, and so by about third grade, maybe they've heard you know, a million less words than other children. And so their speech is affected. Their thought processes are affected. They can't catch up anymore. So uh, your concerns about education are profound and, and I think right on. And uh, it's gonna be already, I think the educational system is a little wobbly. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I have one more thing. So, so when I think about, this, for, for 2,000 years, the Catholic Church has been trying to impress upon its adherents, right, who we are in relationship to God. Right? And we, we have a robust theological anthropology in terms of who we are in relationship to God, right? And, and I think the Catholic Church has kind of been the antithesis of, like, reeds being blown in the wind, right? So what, what's funny is, as you're, as you're presenting about uh, theology of the child, what, what really impressed itself upon me was the fact that, yes, we kind of collapse, right, the cultural notions of the child and how we're to think about the child, right? Nowhere else are you going to get that in the history of Catholicism, right, who for 2,000 years has been thinking of everything under the sun in relationship to God, yeah. with the exception of, of children, kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, so what I'd like to do is like a, a brief thought experiment. So let, let's say that we want to reverse this trend, right? What we want to do is to, is to give all Catholics and maybe all Christians a solid idea about what it is to be a child and how we as adults ought to respond to children, okay? So let's say that you get a call from Pope Francis tomorrow, right? And he says, yeah. Sandy, I want, I'm creating a new dicastery for a theology of the child. <laughs> Come to the Vatican, yeah. right? And you're going to have unlimited resources. And try to start giving us a solid theological foundation followed by let's say, a practical platform for yeah. action yeah. in terms of what the Catholic Church is going to think about children and how we're going to treat kids. Yeah. I would say, you know, a lot, but one thing I would say is don't instrumentalize children. Children are not a means to an end. They're an end. They're not somebody who's going to be somebody. They are somebody, right? And they're not to be viewed as, you know, it's going to be great when you're an adult and you're a tax-paying citizen, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to be, you know, you are somebody right now and to um, uh, try to understand what that actually means. So, well, thank you all. You've been a great audience. Thanks, Dr. Sam. We appreciate it.